Hi everyone, it's Rob Ryder. Sunday, June 26, 2016. Today we're going to talk about the Victim's Guide to Poaching. I believe that's what's happening to us. Uh, and, uh, well, let's start with this. My email address is courtofrecord at AOL.com. Very easiest way to get a hold of me is to use the email address. I don't usually look at all the um, comments on my videos or on the blog, and if you were to take any time to look at them, you'd understand why. I ain't got time for all that. The easiest way to get a hold of me, you want to give me something, is at my email address, courtofrecord at AOL.com. So what does it mean to poach? Well, uh, to boil slightly, well, we could say that we feel that way sometimes about this. To dress by boiling slightly? Yeah, okay, we're talking about eggs, right? Uh, to begin and not complete. Well, I see a lot of that with uh, what we would call legal processes, where they may begin something, but they don't seem to complete it because they never sign it. Uh, to tread on soft ground, to steal game properly to pocket game or to steal it and convey it away in a bag. Now does that sound like an animal? Right? Is that what we're talking about? Is poaching sound like it has anything at all to do with shooting a deer in somebody else's property and hauling it away? To steal, to plunder by stealth. There you are. So these are the things that are happening to us in this society that we live in. And, um, you know, that is... Uh, Nicolaitans, basically, the Pharisees, the scribes, the publicans, the Nicolaitans, and all the bad people in the New Testament that Jesus had a problem with, well, they're still here. And uh, it's our turn to do something about it. So, uh, that's what we're going to be looking at. See how that fits in. So, question, what does Chief Justice John Roberts, the DNR, which is the Department of Natural Resources, and the Latin Church have in common? Well, the answer to that is, I don't know, other than what I'm going to I want to talk about all three in this video. And that's mainly because I had already done something to Chief Justice John Roberts, and I like to make public record of it. Um, it is tied to the Latin Church, because those who believe that they're Roman Catholic, you're not. That's, the, that's not the sui juris particular church of the Catholic Church. That would be called the Latin Church. And Department of Natural Resources, which, hey, as it turns out, they are law enforcement, and they seem to have more to do with the land than, uh, you know, than most. So, I've sent them a complaint also. And, uh, so, let's see what we got going. Uh, but before we do, please, if you could, just pause now and write down that PayPal account, which is ashleyritlewski at gmail.com. A-S-H-L-E-Y. R Y T L E W S K I at gmail dot com, or put something in the mail if you could. To myself, Robert Rutluski at one zero nine five five fourteen Mile Road Northeast, excuse me, Rockford, Michigan four nine three four one. To all who have donated, thank you so very much. I could never have done the study that I got to do, and uh, you know my payback for that is to try to provide these videos and help the common good. I don't, uh, I don't take people's fees for doing things for them, but I can I'll certainly take your donation. So uh, if you can, please help. So enough on that. Let me get it this out of the way first, I guess. So because I can, um, I found, uh, well, I believe to be the email addresses for the justices on the Supreme Court just by Googling for them. And John... Glover Roberts, Jr. So his would be like John Roberts. I don't even believe I had a period between the John and the Roberts at supremecourt.gov or whatever that particular thing is. Um, so I sent him a complaint. And it didn't bounce back, so hey, it went to somebody. We'll find out what happened. But uh, this is why I told uh, John Glover Roberts, Jr., Chief Justice of the United States, Mr. Chief Justice, this relation on behalf of the United States of America is to make your conscience fully aware of the ongoing rebellion against the laws of the United States by enemies foreign and domestic, and to remind you of your duty to God and country. U.S. Constitution amended Article 2, Subsection 3, apparently that's the proper way to cite the U.S. Constitution, or that's what it said on Google, 
in part states, He shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed, and shall commission all officers of the United States. And they were talking about, Section 2 is about the President. So the President shall take care that all laws be faithfully executed, and shall, 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 shall commission all officers of the United States. He may not appoint them all directly, but he has to commission them all. Why? Well, because the Constitution says, and I don't care how much work it seems like. It's still his job. Mr. Chief Justice, the laws of the United States are not faithfully executed because the presidents have, has, if just one, or have not, because it's a, probably most of them, not commissioned any officers of the United States to execute said laws. Instead of laws faithfully executed, the peaceful inhabitants of the United States of America are terrorized by use of simulated legal process under a color of law to extort their private wealth, kidnap men and women for ransom, children for satanic sacrifice. Mr. Chief Justice, no appointee is constitutionally appointed an officer of the United States until the appointee has subscribed his letters patent, that would be his presidential commission, mandated oath of office, and possibly other memorials to the event. Dennis Stephen Rutkus of the Congressional Research Service has written extensively, and if you were to Google his name, you would find these reports online. In numerous CRS, which is Congressional Research Service, reports on the subject and paraphrasing his work, the President signs the commission, as does the Attorney General, who also has the date of commission inscribed and the Justice Department seal affixed. The letters patent, oaths of office, and other documents are then mailed by registered mail to the nominee by the Deputy Attorney General. The nominee must then have his oath administered, sign his commission, and other memorials to appointment prior to the appointee exercising any of the constitutional powers of the office. Where's the proof? Go ask Dennis. That's the way it works. If they don't have that, you're not an officer of the United States. I, I don't care how many. I have no respect to person, right? So unless you can show me your certificate, you don't have any freaking jurisdiction. And, well, as it turns out, they don't. Other than a reference in the Federal Register to the Presidential Document by Executive Office of the President, Memorandum to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Delegation of Authority to Appoint Commission Officers of the Ready Reserve Corps of the Public Health Service, no other indication that the President has appointed any officers of the United States seems to exist. Not even the appointment of the Secretary of Health and Human Services that would allow said officer to exercise the delegated powers of the president because we're talking about a presidential proclamation and well it should be in the federal register right where where are all the presidential documents supposed to be if the president does something official where is it officially kept track of wherever that is should be a shitload of commissions that have been issued and uh we'll go try to find one the president has a duty to commission all officers of the united states hey i read that in the constitution and he has not done so then, and if he has not done so, then he is warring with the Constitution and must be impeached. There is no record of any presidential appointments in the Federal Register, not even yours, Chief Justice Roberts. No federal judges, attorney generals, secretaries of this or that, directors, general counsels, or other officers of the United States can provide full proof evidence of their appointment, that would include U.S. attorneys, where is the public record? By what authority do they reign? They don't. So tell them. Show me your commission. Go point it out in the Constitution. Article 2, Section 3 says, The President shall commission all officers of the United States. It's the very last sentence. It's just the last few words. That's all you really need. And say, where's yours? You don't have one, then you don't have any authority. Yet today, de facto agents acting as federal judges, officers of the United States, will sit in judgment of simulated legal processes aided by a cadre of false accusers in private ecclesiastic tribunals proceeding under Talmudic law. All will use unregistered pseudonyms to conceal their full legal name on documents of the in the court, using threat, coercion, and address to compel tacit agreement to their authority to rape, pillage, and plunder. Just look at the paperwork on these federal cases. It starts with the name of the court. Just It starts with in the. There is no freaking court named in the. Go read what it says to do in the um, 
Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, you need to put the name of the court at the top of the paper. Well, that's its proper name. What is the proper name of the court? And there's no proper name of a court with the words in the as part of the name. At least not a federal court or a state court. Now, it could be a private tribunal. They can name it whatever they want to. Hey, they did. They just added in the to the name of the real court. I wish to also make you aware that there are no sitting senators or representatives in Congress as none of these individuals has a certificate of election, nor have they signed an oath of office or any other details necessarily executed as part of the process. It's A, B, C. It's like baking a cake, man. You got to do the steps, get a cake. Don't do the steps, well, you're not going to get a cake. And they don't follow the steps. These same styles of defense infect all state and local elected and appointed officers, leaving the United States of America unprotected in violation of treaty. The unlawful conversion of the United States of America and its inhabitants, that would be us, identities and properties is the result of high crimes and misdemeanors by those acting as officers of the United States, individual states, and political subdivisions. Alleged, Mr. Chief Justice, can you prove your constitutional appointment? If so, then you are the Supreme Court, and justice demands your swift, swift execution of law. Um, there's only one judge pointed out in the Constitution for the Supreme Court, and it's the Chief Justice, because it says when you impeach the President, the Chief Justice still sit as the judge. He's the only judge, he's the only office, judicial office mandated by Constitution. The rest of them don't have a frickin' appointment because the president hasn't appointed them. The, 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 the Senate may have confirmed, the Senate may have done whatever the Senate does, but where is the beef? Show me the certificate under the seal of the frickin' Justice Department. Signed by the president, signed by the attorney general, <laughs> signed by the appointee. And that's the dude I want to talk to. Please, I'm looking for one. I am including a series of letters complaints I recently sent to the Department of Justice and FBI relating to this subject that I have that I have yet to go on unanswered because the Department of Justice has a shitload to do with the commissioning of um, officers of the United States. You could also subpoena my email address. Please do. A subpoena my email address, com for more complete description of the various defects in the law that plague children of God I have made federal offices aware of. I have pointed more things out to more people than I care to think about. I wish you also to contact the Patriarch of the Latin Church on my behalf, telling him that an alleged 501c3 corporation and its franchises is refusing my membership into the Latin Church. The Code of Canon Law in 1983 states in the very first canon that these canons only apply to the Latin Church. Canons 111 112 make it clear that we, the baptized, must choose a sui juris, per, sui juris particular church to be a member of. And I picked the Latin Church. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops franchisees will not produce the enrollment book and are concealing my existence from the Latin Church. And in so doing, they are denying the Holy Ghost and may need penitential reformation. My sacramental certificates are attached as evidence to my claim. I declare in penalty perjury, the foregoing to be is true and correct. I did that on the 22nd. And so, um, I haven't heard anything from Chief Justice Roberts, but it did go through, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, hey, he's been served. And this idea of the sui juris church, you are not a Roman Catholic if you think you are. No, you're a Latin. You're a member of the Latin church. But if you look at your certificates, what we will in a second, they don't say anywhere on there anything about the Latin rite or the Latin church, yet the very first canon in canon law says it only applies to the Latin church, which is the sui juris particular church that those who call themselves Roman Catholics should be a member of. And because we're not, that's why the Pope just said that all these marriages are invalid. Because you're not in the church. You're what they call a baptized pagan. And I pointed this stuff out before, but it was just recently, you know, it's like everything else. It, the good stuff is sometimes at the very beginning. And so at the very beginning of canon law, in the very first canon, it says that the laws only apply to the Latin church. And there's no... Um, we don't have any record of being in the Latin church. So I'm going to get that done right now. Let me talk about that real quick just so I can say I had Because I really want, this is really to spend more time on uh, the fact that we're being poached. 
and that complaint that I've just submitted today. So here's the Code of Canon Law, 1983, and uh, very first canon. The canons of this code concern only the Latin Church. The canons of this code concern only the Latin Church. I'll say it one more time. The canons of this code concern only the Latin Church. That's just the way it is. Okay, and um, so how this affects baptism. Um, because as it turns out, it looks like it isn't the Holy See that we want to be in. We want to be in a thing called the Apostolic See. And if you were to download a copy of this can of law and go through it, you could look up like Apostolic See and all these different key words and you would see that the Apostolic See and the Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic, but the Universal Church, the Universal Church and the Apostolic See are considered moral persons, which is different than a state, which is considered a person, but not necessarily a moral person. Uh, okay, so Canon 111. Through the reception of baptism, a child becomes a member of the Latin Church if the parents belong to that church, or should one of them not belong to it, if they have both by common consent chosen that the child be baptized in the Latin Church. If that common consent is lacking, the child becomes a member of the ritual church to which his father belongs, but not necessarily a sui juris ritual church. As we'll see here in a second, there's a difference. Any candidate for baptism who has completed the 14th year of age may freely choose to be baptized in either the Latin Church or another autonomous, autonomous, right, that's sui juris, this is the English version of sui juris, autonomous ritual church, in which case the person belongs to the church which he or she has chosen. After recession of baptism, the following becomes a member of, of another autonomous ritual church. So there's 24 autonomous ritual churches. Go figure. 24 churches. There's 24 elders in Revelation. Of which the Pope is only one. He's over the Latin church. And then there's these 23 other autonomous ritual churches that are the various forms of Catholic church. They call the Eastern Catholic churches. So there's 24 elders, of which the uh, patriarch of the Latin Church, because now he isn't the Pope, now we're talking about a dude called the patriarch of the Latin Church, is uh, the first of unequals. Those who have obtained permission from the Apostolic See, see there's the Apostolic See, didn't say Holy See. Uh, however, so into an autonomous ritual church, but this is the part uh, I wanted to get to. The practice, however long-standing, of receiving the sacraments according to the right of an autonomous ritual church does not bring with it membership of that church. Therefore, just because you've been baptized the way that they would baptize someone in a Latin church doesn't make you a member of the Latin church. It's a matter of consent. You have to say that you want to belong. And so right now, that's what we're asking. I mean, I've, I sent a, I've sent uh, uh, a couple of emails to the um, the Holy See's permanent observer at the United Nations in Geneva, and I'm trying to get him to give me an answer. And uh, a couple of other people are trying other ways to get answers, and we're going to find out, well, how do we become a member of the Latin Church? Because right now, you are not a member of the Latin Church. If you're, well, I'll show you. All right, this is a certificate of baptism for myself, Robert Allen Ritluski, and they got mom and dad in their, um, my mother and her maiden name, which technically would mean, well, then they weren't married, and now I'm a baptized bastard. But hey, that's okay. Right here, according to the right of the Roman Catholic Church, according to the right of the Roman Catholic, it didn't say according to the Latin right, which probably could have been correct. It said according to the right of the Roman Catholic Church. And Roman Catholic Church is not a sui juris particular church. That's a freaking trade name. Or it defines a particular section of the Catholic Church, but it's not the sui juris. 
Latin church. And I'm going to do more of that in another video. But I had to talk about it now because I had talked about it in this thing I sent to the Chief Justice, and eh, so be it. Um, some other things I sent to the Chief Justice, because he's, if you go to the Department of Justice website, you there's a place on there where you can send questions to all the different agencies that make up the Department of Justice, such as uh, Office of Public Affairs, or to the Attorney General herself, or to the Deputy Attorney General, or to all these different offices. And so I picked a bunch of them and I sent them different kinds of complaints that are very similar to what I sent the Chief Justice. I'm not going to go through them, but I'm just saying, hey, you know, there's all sorts of ways to bitch about things, and so this is another one. And so I had sent this along, and I sent it to Sally Q. Gates, who's supposed to be the Deputy Attorney General, and she's the one who should have taken what the President had signed, what the Attorney General had signed, ensuring that it had the date and the seal of the, the uh, Justice Department on it, package it together with the oaths of office, especially for a judge, because they have to take two oaths of office, and send it on to the appointee who has to sign the oath of offices and have them, uh, well he has to have his oaths administered and he probably has to sign them but he has to sign the commission and all that has to become a record someplace and you know you, you can't find a record for anybody that they did this article 2 section 3 United States mandates that the president shall commission all officers of the United States just can't get away from it uh, okay yada 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 so that's that's really enough of that I'm not into I don't need to go through those so much. But I do need you to donate, if you can, please. Um, there you are. Okay, but let's get into why we're here. Why are we here? How are we being poached? Well, let's just start with some stuff, right? So this is 28-6A uh, is out of the Michigan Compiled Laws. MCL 28-6A says... Conservation officers, appointment by commissioner as state police officers. The commissioner is hereby authorized, with the approval of the director of conservation and the governor, to appoint any conservation officer as a special state police officer who shall be vested with the powers of an officer of the state police and who shall, in his capacity as special state police officer, be under the direction of the commissioner. Okay, well, we read about poached. Uh, and this is what it says on the website that's kind of hard to read but so on the DNR website which is here right? we read this part right here Michigan Department of Natural Resources Law Enforcement yada yada where it says Michigan Conservation Officers COs are fully commissioned state peace officers that makes them a conservator of the peace who provided who provide natural resource protection and ensure recreation safety as well as provide general law enforcement duties in the communities they serve. The SEALs are stationed nearly every county of the state doing regular patrols responding to law enforcement needs, responding to law enforcement needs, responding to law enforcement needs. They are also first responders to a variety of natural disasters and emergencies. They are a unique class of law enforcement officer whose duties include enforcing regulations for outdoor recreation, such as off-road vehicle use, snowmobiling, boating, and so forth. And see this thing about off-road vehicle use? That is how we should be titling and registering our automobiles. Not as motor vehicles on the motor vehicle side, but as off-road vehicles on the off-road vehicle side. We'll be into that in just a minute. Uh, Michigan conservation officers are fully commissioned as state peace officers with full power and authority to enforce Michigan's criminal laws. Well, that would be the penal code. <laughs> Outstanding. I can. I know a little bit about the penal code. I could probably pick a few things out, make a complaint. Because see, I had already done this before on the exact idea of what I'm going to show that I wrote a complaint on to the supposedly the chief judge of the district court of the 60 I think I'm in the 63rd district or something like that and um, I was in video court because they had you know they had picked me up for something after I had sent these complaints in 
I sent her three different complaints. As I remember, this is four or five years ago, so you know, don't hold me to any of this. Exactly. Um, and because I was uh, at the time having my little tiffs with the power company, the power company wouldn't come to my house anymore to read the meter unless the police would escort them. So they get the police to escort them, and the police would check me out, and say, "Hey, we could take this guy in because he's got this want for." this traffic violation I was supposed to have had. Um, and so they, you know, took me off my porch and took me to jail. Well, when I got to jail, you know, I this was the time, this was about the third or fourth time I'd been there, and so this time I wasn't going to answer their shit. When they come in, you know, they come in the holding cell, and they want you, they're going to ask you your last name, right? And they want you to go by your last name. And um, as I remember, when they would ask me, first time who you are I said uh, I'm an immortal living soul created in the image of God here is one of his people you can call me Robert Allen or I said I'm Robert Allen an immortal living soul created in the image of God here is one of his people I think that's probably how I said it and of course they bark a little bit I said Brad what part didn't you understand I just told you who I am I'm Robert Allen an immortal living soul created in the image of God here is one of his people well, soon enough, they just call you Robert Allen. They quit trying to get me to go by my last name. They just call me Robert Allen. But I wouldn't fingerprint, and I wouldn't do the other stuff, so I had to stay in the holding cell. And, you know, you learn really quick. This is the third time I spent multiple days in a holding cell to grab a roll of toilet paper because that's going to be your pillow. You're going to eat a lot of bologna sandwiches, and, uh, you know, that used to give me pretty bad heartburn. That was just the price I had to pay. But, um, anyways... So I go to this video court, even though I hadn't been fingerprinted, I hadn't done anything, I hadn't even been processed in, but I'd been in the holding cell four days. They call me into video court after everybody else had gone through, and now I'm in the room by myself, and there's the judge, and she's going to start like we're talking about what I'm in jail for. And somebody hands her these papers and said, but what I really want to do is talk about these documents that you sent to me. And first, I want you to know that I spent a lot of time studying these. I really, really had to study these. And blah, 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 blah. There was one about the utility, as I remember. There was one about the, well, really the reason I was there, this traffic ticket, you know, that had happened a couple of years before, that it was a simulated legal process. And uh, there was one other one that I had in. Oh, I think it was, uh, was against uh, Consumers Energy because they're supposed to be a public utility but they don't have a franchise with the township and it says in the Michigan Constitution that all public utilities have a franchise with the township they ain't got one so everything they do is simulate a legal process right that was all my blah blah and she and she said that she read all these and and then she said you know the, these words that I'll never forget because she said well it's not that you're not correct but I'm not inclined to issue any warrants now, if you know anything about logic circuits or knots, right, a double knot cancels it out, so I am correct. I am correct, but she's not going to issue any warrants. And I said to her, well, that would mean you're just going to perpetuate the fraud. And she said, well, you can um, appeal my decision to the circuit court. To which I said, well, I would if I knew who the circuit court was, but I thought you were the district court and you can't take my complaint. So I don't really know what I'm supposed to do, so I'm done, and I just fucking headed to the door started walking out, and you know, what you're going to do? I'm already in jail. Uh, and, you know, the, there's a guy sitting in there, he's listening to all this. He didn't move, didn't budge as I'm walking out. So I ended up spending another day in there, because that's what I had left on this time, I guess, and... Uh, but, you know, she was nice enough to at least acknowledge that I had sent these complaints. Thank you, Jesus. If I had to go to jail, at least I got something out of it, right? I came out with something I didn't know before. And so, she's just the wrong place. Well, as it turns out, Michigan Conservation, the DNR, has the state broke up into, guess what, into districts. And so they could just as easily be the district court as the Black Robe Priest is the district court, because I know that the judge I saw isn't a judge of the state because she doesn't have a certificate of election or certificate of appointment under the great seal from the state. 
right? If they're going to be an officer of the state, they got to be appointed or elected, have a commission or an appointment under the seal of the state, or they don't have any jurisdiction to enforce the laws of the state. That's their constitutional authority, that piece of paper. Without it, they don't have any they don't have any jurisdiction in the state. But they could have in a private tribunal that they have coerced you to be a member of their private ecclesiastic society, and this is a church matter. It's not a matter of the state. Or they made you a member of their tribe. And we'll see that they do that, too. And um, if you're a member of their tribe, well, then they have jurisdiction over you. So it's a tribal membership issue. And it, the Department of Natural Resources, at least in Michigan, has things to do with uh, you know, tribal matters. So let's continue on. All right, there are a unique class of uh, enforcement officer. Well, I'm not going to deny it, whose duties include enforcing regulations for outdoor recreation, off road vehicles. They also are empowered to arrest those who commit felonies, misdemeanors, and civil violations of the Michigan law. Well, I can point some laws out that I know that people have violated that. Uh, well, at least, well, that's what I'm going to point them out and say, hey, they violated them. Go check me out see if I'm correct. Uh, they are at times will work jointly with every branch of law enforcement, whether it's federal, state, local, tribal. CLs often take part in multi-agency operations, patrols, training exercises, U.S. Coast Guard, Michigan State Police, County Sheriff Department, City Police Department. All these are lower case. I mean, this is all proper case stuff, so I just hope it has some value. And so this is, and, and so, as you can see, um, they're the same as like the Coast Guard, Customs, Border Patrol, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is like the national level of the Department of Natural Resources. And they have jurisdiction in federal criminal law. And it's these tribal agencies we're dealing with. This is what the County of Kent is and the uppercase state of Michigan. Right? The in the 1835 Constitution, the state of Michigan, proper case, those words with the the as being part of the title, right? That is the title of the republic. It's not called state of Michigan. Yet that's who we're dealing with. So the state of Michigan is like a, it's either a tribe or it's in the United States of America, which is uh, under King George III and his successors. These are all things I talked about in other videos and blah, blah, blah getting tired of talking about it. I'm sure you're tired of hearing about it, so let's just move on. Um, so give me a second to reload some paper. That's what I need to do. Hang on just a second. Where's... Okay, so um, we're going to be talking about this old ticket I had. This is from uh, like 19... Uh, excuse me, 2011. And it's on a thing called the State of Michigan Uniform Law Citation. And every state has some, apparently, it just seems like they have some kind of uniform law citation that they're all supposed to use. Doesn't matter what the agency is, the form is the same. Something that's been approved by the Supreme Court or the Attorney General or however it gets approved. And this is what they're supposed to use when they do whatever they're going to do to you. And so the, the question is, well, did they do it right? And it doesn't take long to say, well, you know, I'm going to say, no, they didn't do it right. Now, we can look for lots of reasons why that is, but I'll show you the first one is because they give me the court copy. And I'm not the first one. They did this to my brother-in-law down in Florida just recently. They cited him for something, and they gave him the court copy. Well, if you have the court copy... Then, uh, what did, uh... Oh, hang on a second. Son of a bitch. All right. Hey, sorry about that. Um, somebody was nice enough to run the vacuum, but it's just the wrong time to do it. And uh, I'm not really sure where I was when I left off. But I was talking about this old ticket that has been done improperly because I'll show you a few things here. They don't write down, you know, expired registration, no proof of insurance, uh, expired operator's license. They don't put the laws down. The offense codes are supposed to go down here. One, two, three. There are no offense codes. Right? So, um, 
is it a violation of a local ordinance, a state law, or administrative rule? Well, they said state law. Well, then all these should have a number to go with them. They don't do it right. And there is no officer name printed C. Potts. Right? That's not his full legal name. There's no officer named C. Potts. That wouldn't be on his oath of office or his commission or nothing else. It doesn't exist. And he gave me the court copy, as I said. So if I have the court copy, then who has my copy? Because if we looked at these, there's things on the back of these that you're supposed to do. You can't appear <laughs> at court unless you have your copy. That's what's on the back of your copy, where you would write down about your appearance. And instead, they give you know they give you apparently they give you the court copy. And I think I'd said before the little disruption there that. Uh, my brother-in-law, he got one here recently, pulled over, and he got the court copy. So, you know, look at your paperwork to see if it's the court copy. So what is this? Well, this is supposed to be a citation. And uh, so we're going to read a few of the laws about citations and how they're supposed to have done this and what certain things mean, such as civil infraction. Because on this document up here, right, that's what they check these boxes. Uh, civil infraction, misdemeanor, civil infraction. Well, what the heck is a civil infraction? Means an act or omission that is prohibited by a law and not and is not a crime under that law. Well, how can that be? If it's not a crime, then how can you say that I can't do it? Right? This is the thing. I don't agree with your civil infraction. To me, that's unconstitutional, but that's what it means. An act or omission that is prohibited by a law and is not a crime under that law, or that is prohibited by an ordinance and is not a crime under that ordinance, and for which civil sanctions may be ordered. Civil infractions include, but are not limited to, the following. And this this part doesn't go to it after that, but um, that's what it is. So what you know what does that mean? How can how is it they can hold you for something? Well, they can't. I'm gonna say if, it, if I didn't violate it, if I didn't. You have no jurisdiction because I didn't commit a crime. You said it's a civil infraction. That's not a crime. So I, you don't have any jurisdiction over me. Right? So that may be something that their church believes in, but I don't belong to their church. So either it's a crime or it didn't happen. Uh, citation. So that so this is what this document is supposed to be, right? This document is a it's a State of Michigan Uniform Law Citation. Uh, as used in this act, citation means a complaint or notice upon which a police officer shall record occurrence involving one or more vehicle violations by a person cited. Each citation shall be numbered consecutively, be in a form determined by the Secretary of State, Attorney General, State of Court Administrator, and Director of the Department of State Police. So I guess that's what that form is. The original, which shall be a complaint or notice to appear by the officer and shall be filed with the court in which the appearance is to be made. That's where this copy was supposed to go. <laughs> this is supposed to go to the court. You know, because I only have this. I, I must have made a copy of it. I can't find the original original, but I can find this, right? And it says court copy one, so this would have been the one on the top and the one that they signed. So this is, would have been the original. All right. The first copy shall be retained by local traffic enforcement. The second copy shall be delivered to the alleged violator if it's a misdemeanor. The third copy to the alleged violator if it's a civil infraction. And um, so this is just uh, so this is what that would look like when they go to get them printed, apparently. Um, It's like the fronts are all the same, right? This is the same, right? Sheet one. This is sheet two. This is sheet three. This is sheet four. So, um, four. Okay. So, here's the court copy. Right, so this is sheet five, which is the back of sheet one, or this is the fifth page right here. Right, so this is what's on the back of the court copy. 
Well, then this is the this is the back of the officer's copy. Officer's note, weather, remarks. This is the back of the misdemeanor copy. You must appear at the time and place indicated on the front of this complaint or warrant will be issued for your arrest. Right? And you have to sign and date your freaking your paper. But they didn't give you that copy. Nor did they give you or myself the infraction copy. Which hey, it's got some place for me to sign also. Right? So they don't have the court copy. You have the court copy, but you don't have this copy. But the cop still has this other copy, so could he have given that to them as uh, a testimony to the fact that he had done it at some later date? If it was a real court, I guess he could. But the point is, I have the court's copy. Uh, okay. Purpose of this act, a complaint signed by a police officer shall be treated as made under oath if the violation alleged in the complaint is either a civil infraction or a misdemeanor or ordinance violation for which the maximum permissible penalty does not exceed 93 days or a fine. So if there's any fine involved or if the length of time for the thing is more than 93 days, they can't use this form. Right. It, for this act, a complaint signed by the police shall be treated as made under oath if the violation alleged in the complaint is either a civil infraction or misdemeanor or ordinance violation for which the maximum permissible penalty does not exceed 93 days. Well, there can't be any civil infraction for more than 93 days because it, it's not against the law. And so all they could do is have it be a fine, and well, if it's a fine, then hey, you really can't use this, right? I mean, this is the the way the system works. Um, at or before the completion of his or her tour of duty, a police officer to whom a citation book has been issued and who has recorded the occurrence of a vehicle law violation upon a citation shall deliver to his or her police chief or to a person duly authorized by the police chief to receive citations all copies of the citation duly signed the police chief or person duly authorized by the police chief shall deposit the original of the citation with the court having jurisdiction over the offense not later than three days after the date of the citation now that's really interesting because I remember being on the phone with a guy once we were working on his motor vehicle violation and so he had, he had called the um, court I'll say court clerk works in the back room for the, with the judge I want to say court administrator I guess is who it was it would be the court administrator and uh, somehow I ended up in the conversation and um, the court administrator said well we don't get the tickets here until the day before court it's like, well, how can that be? This says, you, you know, I didn't know that then, but I know it now. It says, well, you're supposed to get the court, supposed to have it within three days after the date of the citation. So who is it going to? If a citation is spoiled, mutilated, or voided, it shall be endorsed with a full explanation, therefore, by the police officer voiding the citation. It shall be accounted for to the police officer's police chief or an authorized designee of the police chief okay now this one's interesting nothing in this act shall prevent a person other than a police so not the police officer but somebody other than a police officer from applying for a criminal complaint for a vehicle law violation that is not a civil infraction in other words it's a misdemeanor and that does not and that and that person need not show the alleged offender has been issued a citation in connection with the offense. Which is saying if the guy that pulled me over really wasn't a cop and he just pretended with this piece of paper to simulate a legal process but had in fact gone then and done a criminal complaint which is a, they have a misdemeanor criminal complaint that he could have filled out 
for a vehicle violation that is not a civil infraction. And as we saw, right, he made it a point to say, well, this is civil infraction and this is civil infraction, but this one's a misdemeanor and uh, it would be 257.301 expired operation, operator's license. Now, that isn't the name of that section, but doesn't matter, right? He's pointing out that that one is a misdemeanor, and so he could have gone, according to this, and done a criminal complaint for that one and never have issued me a citation, which he never did because he gave me the court copy. So they're doing this on a form other than whatever's happening is happening because of a document from somebody other than a police officer who's saying that you have violated a criminal complaint or applied for a criminal complaint for a vehicle law violation. That is not a civil infraction. So it would be anything that's a misdemeanor or a felony. A civil infraction means an act of remission that is prohibited by law and is not a crime under the law. Right? So you, they couldn't file a criminal complaint for a civil infraction because it's not a crime. Interesting. Uh, I don't know how many of these I wanted to read. That's probably about it. Uh, civil infraction, civil infraction. Municipal civil infraction means a civil infraction involving a violation of an ordinance. But they'd have, if, see, if they're going to say that you committed an ordinance violation, then on this ticket, they would have to go ahead and file. Uh, where, where are you? Where are you? Right here, local ordinance, state law, administrative rule, the person named above in violation of one of those. As I remember, at this particular, I was actually sitting in a parking lot. I wasn't driving anyways. I'd gone into the post office and came out and got my car, and the dude walked up to me. So he must have checked my license or something, my plate, while I was, uh, I was in the building. So, okay, so I'm going to complain about this. Even though this is from uh, 2011, uh, there is no statute of limitations on fraud. All right. Let's see what else there is. Hang on just a second. Okay, so... Um, because it's what is said that these conservation officers can uh, enforce the criminal code of the or the criminal laws of Michigan, and uh, I want to find one, so I went to this page here. Where it says locate a conservation officer, and as you can see, they have split the state up into numerous districts. District one. Well, I'm looking for the district court, and I'm in uh, Kent, so that would be according to this seven. And county served, Allegan, Barry, Barron, Cadiz, and Ionia, Kalamazoo, Kent, Muskegon, and so forth. General Jared, Gerald Thayer. One other thing I noticed about this, right? None of these people use a middle initial. That, that was nice. So I wrote General, or uh, General, Lieutenant Gerald Thayer, a complaint about this ticket. And in that complaint, I said, uh, Lieutenant Thayer, hi, Robert Allen Rutluski, sui juris, accept your oath of office, bind you to the same, and remind you of your duty to God and country. According to the Conservation Officer Review section of the DNR website, that duty includes the following statement. Michigan Conservation Officers are fully commissioned as state peace officers with full power and authority to enforce the Michigan criminal laws. For the record, that would be the Michigan Penal Code, and I now task you with enforcing it. Lieutenant Thayer, this relation is intended to make your conscience fully aware of the use of simulated legal processes by alleged public officers and employees representing local, state, federal officers, offices, and agencies. Complaint. So see the penal code for the section and chapters that I reference as we go. So agents and attorneys of the state of Michigan and other usurpers willfully engage in simulated legal processes, that would be section 368, in order to trespass on the real and personal property of Michigan inhabitants and extort the same. That would be chapter 34. 
For the record, I do not consent to the jurisdiction of the state of Michigan and consider their activities a larceny. That would be chapter LII. Is that 21? Is L 20? I don't remember. Uh, no, it can't be. Because we already went past 20 here. Whatever L means. It must be 50. Individuals impersonating and falsely representing themselves as public officers or employees of the state of Michigan. That would be a... 217 violation. It's political subdivisions and municipalities to coerce tacit consent to the ongoing larceny of private property and acts of terror. The ongoing frauds perpetrated by those of the state of Michigan, County of Kent, Township of Oakfield, and other professionals is the work of RICO criminal enterprise that will not hesitate to act as use acts of terror and, and traffic in humans. Finally laid it on thick. Because that's what they're doing with this ticket. You do realize, right, that this ticket is a form of human trafficking. Right? They, after he wrote this, he put handcuffs on my ass and took me to jail. Well, that's <laughs> that's kidnapping. If he's not an officer of the state, and that it really isn't a state court that I went to, and if the things I said are true, then this is a this is a, a an instrument of human tra uh, human trafficking. Other individuals allegedly claim to be officers of the United States, but they do not have a presidential commission as mandated in the Constitution of the United States, Article 2, Section 3, nor have they filed a valid oath of office as mandated in 5 U.S.C. 3331. These individuals have no constitutional authority to enforce the laws of the United States. They are not the United States officers. They are its enemies, foreign and domestic. Beware of Nicolaitan, Pharisees, doctors of the law, scribes, publicans, and the rest. This deceit is biblical, worldwide, and extremely well entrenched, and it's beyond the scope of this simple complaint to try to explain any more than one example of the style of fraud done daily against your lieutenant and my loved ones, simulated violations of the Michigan Vehicle Code. And so, State of Michigan Uniform Law Citations, Cedar Spring Police Department, Agency ORI. And you get that, that's down here at the bottom. Whatever that is. That's what we're talking about, right? They're involved. Yada, yada, yada. An image of the court copy one is attached for your review. This instrument is a simulated legal process with which any number of individuals have conspired as an organized criminal enterprise to extort and embezzle my private wealth, resorting to the use of acts of, uh, acts of terror to perpetuate their fraud. If I had the court copy, <laughs> what, what did the court have? The individual, right, officer name printed, a.k.a. C. Potts, with officer's ID number 5, perjured himself, impersonated a public officer employee and created this document simulating a legal process in violation of the Michigan Penal Code. For the record, this document is also a false statement in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1001 and numerous federal criminal civil rights statutes and an intentional crime, uh, crime against humanity. Management of the Cedar Springs Police Department participated in these felonies, as has the individual, a.k.e. Sarah J. Smolinski. Ms. Smolinski claims to be a lawyer licensed to practice law, that's her registration number, in Michigan, and acts as an alleged, elected, or appointed judge of the state. She uses the fictitious name Sarah J. Smolinski to hide her true, full legal name from the record of her deceit. Unless the name Sarah J. Smolinski is found in the official role of attorneys and she has an appointment, appointment commission or certificate of election, as the case may be, under the great seal of the state, in the name Sarah J. Smolinski, she cannot be a state judicial officer. If the office of the great seal cannot certify Sarah J. Smolinski appointment or election as a judge of the state of Michigan, then Sarah J. Smolinski is impersonating an office of the state. Officer of the state. <laughs> so are many others. Lieutenant Gerald Thayer, if you are a sworn commission law enforcement officer, then beware that you are one of the few. Most appointed or elected office holders have an intentional defect in their appointment, election, 
take the oath of office, they do not comply with the law, do not file official bonds with impunity, lie, cheat, steal, obstruct justice, terrorize the inhabitants of Michigan, and traffic in children. By deceit, the state of Michigan conspirators compel individuals to agreement that they are a resident of the state of Michigan. This is not the free and independent state defined in the preamble of Michigan Constitution of 1835. The state of Michigan is the full legal name of the republic and anything else is a simulation of a legal process. The state of Michigan is a private society that has entrapped the inhabitants of Michigan, making them, us, indentured servants and worse. The state of Michigan, 1835 Constitution, is the free and independent state in perpetual union with the United States of America, the republic established under the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. Any other title used in a presumed official capacity is a false statement and warring with the Constitution. I do not consent to the jurisdiction of the state of Michigan. I look to you, Lieutenant Gerald Thayer, to help me set all official records straight to eliminate civil defects denying my status as a citizen of the United States and Michigan and the restoration of all rights, titles, and interests in my legal person, that would be my all capital letter name, and Social Security account, 374-506-794, never give them just the last four, give it all to them, and say that's my property, as they have been unlawfully converted to the use of others. Somebody's already taken advantage of your property, man, tell them it's yours. I stated under the penalties of perjury, the foregoing is true and correct, executed June 26, 2006. So what I do when I, when I make one of these up, then I print it out, and I sign it, and then I scan it, and then I send them an email as a scanned copy with a signature, which is good enough. And this time I was uh, Son of God instead of Officer Christ. Uh, this time I'll go as a Son of God. Amen. Um... So that's what I sent to the lieutenant just today, and hey, we'll see what he does with it tomorrow. That and a copy of the ticket, pointing out that, that I'm just going to tell him it's a simulated legal process and have him look at it, because he's an officer of the, he's a DNR law enforcement, District 7 law officer. So this should be interesting. Um, but beyond that, what else is there to learn from the DNR? Well, first of all, let's look at this. I didn't find one for here, but this is uh, something I found looking at my brother-in-law stuff before. Look at where it says in number one, state or Indian tribal organization. Florida. All right, so which one is it? Is it a state or is it an Indian tribal organization? Its address is the Florida Department of Children and Families. 1370 Winewood Boulevard, Tallahassee, Florida, 32399-0700. That's the address, right? So the Florida Department of Children and Families is part of the address for this thing called Florida. It's not like it's um, an entity. It's part of the address. And so anyways, you know, is it the state or is it a tribal thing? Well, that's what we're going to find out. You know, this is a tribal matter. Somebody's trying to make you a member of their tribe, and you don't necessarily want to be part of it. Or their ecclesiastic society, or, you know, whatever the BS is that they we're dealing with. Um, I think the easiest way to do this, I'm just going to... Uh, first of all, I wanna, uh, before we go to off-road vehicle, just to so I can show you where some of these laws came from, from the penal code. All right, so our penal code is called Chapter 750. So MCL 750.217 legal process would explain that a person shall not impersonate, falsely represent himself or herself, or falsely act as a public officer or public employee, and prepare, issue, serve, execute, or otherwise act to further operation of any legal process or unauthorized process that affects or purports to affect persons or property. Okay, I'm going to say that's what they did. Legal process means summons, complaint, pleading, writ, warrant, injunction, notice, subpoena, lien, order, or other document issued or entered by or would or on behalf of a court or lawful tribunal or lawfully filed with, a re with or recorded by a government agency 
that is used as a means of exercising or acquiring jurisdiction over a person or property to assert or give notice of a legal claim against a person or property or to direct persons to take or refrain from taking action. Unauthorized process means the following. A document simulating a legal process. So it's unauthorized to simulate the document they talk about in B, legal process. That is prepared or issued by or on behalf of an entity that purports or represents itself to be a lawful tribunal or court, public officer, or other agency cited establishment authorized or sanctioned by law, but is not a lawful tribunal or court, public officer, or other agency created, established, authorized, or sanctioned by law. And I don't believe... Uh, seems like I closed it. That um, they're using the proper name. Uh, hang on a second here. Jeez. Okay, so now using the proper name, right? Cedar Springs Police Dep. That isn't the proper name of anything. That doesn't exist. And C. Potts doesn't exist. So if they don't exist, then, they're then this is a simulated legal process. It's an unauthorized process. A document that would otherwise be a legal process, except that it was not issued or entered by or on behalf of a court, lawful tribunal, filed with the recorded by a government agency as required by law, which said that the original had to be <laughs> has to be filed with the court and I have the original court copy number one so if I have the original what does the court have they don't so it wasn't put in properly it is an unauthorized process and following that is the thing called a simulated legal process right this is right out of the penal code a person shall not prepare issue serve execute or otherwise act to further an operation of any unauthorized process. That would be anything that an attorney does using the middle initial. He's simulating a legal process. And explains it again, and unauthorized process explains what that is, and we get the idea. And then we got the abusive legal process. Any officer or person who shall willfully make any arrest or institute any legal proceedings or sue out any process for the purpose of attaining fees or mileage that might accrue thereto or therefore shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. So either he was an officer and he abused the legal process, or he wasn't an officer, and he simulated a legal process. I'm going to let Lieutenant Thayer figure it out, because, uh, you know, that's what they do. Um, what next? Where are we now? Citation, conservation. Did I tell these conservation of MCLs? Conservation officer means an employee of the Department of Natural Resources or its predecessor or successor who has sworn to prescribe sworn to the prescribed oath of office and who is designated as a peace officer under section sixteen oh six of the Natural Resources Environmental Protection Act. I just need to find out if that's what Lieutenant Thayer is. If he is, well then he's a conservation officer. He's my he's my best friend. He's the civil authority ordained by God that I've been looking for. Conservation officers as peace officers, powers, privileges, prerogatives, and immunities. Conservation officers appointed by the director of the Department of Natural Resources and trained and certified pursuant to Michigan Law Enforcement Officers Training Council, being whatever, are peace officers. And guess what? They have their own academy. Department of Conservation Office, Peace Officer, Department of Conservation, the Department and Conservation Officer appointed by the Department as Peace Officers vested with all powers, privileges, prerogatives, immunities conferred upon Peace Officers by general laws of the state have the same power to serve criminal process as sheriffs, have the same right as sheriffs to require aid in an executing process, and are entitled to the same fees as sheriffs in performing their duties. There you are. He's a lowercase sheriff. 
Uh, the department may commission park and recreation officers to enforce property on property regulated under, so this would be like in the parks, rules proclamated by the department, orders issued by the department that are authorized in those rules, and any laws of this state specified in those rules as enforceable by commission park and recreational officers. So a commission park and rec recreational officer is not the same as a conservation officer. Uh, may arrest an individual only for minor offenses committed in the officer's presence and shall issue an appearance ticket as provided in subsection 6. So you understand, if they give you one of these pieces of paper and it's been properly done, you have been arrested. It doesn't matter that they're letting you go home with an appearance ticket, you're arrested to appear later. So, you know, this is a probation matter now, you've already been arrested. So this is a false arrest if this isn't done right. Yada, yada, yada. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, I don't know we need any more of that. God creation of the Department of Natural Resources. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, enough of that. Sorry if I'm rambling today. My mind is, my mind is kind of twitchy for some reason. A few many too many things going on. Okay. All that is out of the way about the criminality part. Now let's look at well what else does it say? What says what? When is an ORV, which is an off road vehicle license required? An ORV license, 2625, is required on ed eligible county roads, state forest roads in the Upper Peninsula, and eligible national forest roads, as well as on frozen surfaces of public waters. This license, this license, this license is required to operate anywhere off of private lands. You need to have an off-road vehicle license to drive your car down the road because you just left private lands. I'm guessing. All right, so it's like, well, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter if it is or not. I'm going to say, okay, well, I'm gonna, maybe I want to have an off-road vehicle license instead of a passenger vehicle license. I wonder if I can do that. And I'm going to find out this week. And uh, all of this comes out of you know, like every state, probably, has some kind of act. This is the Off-Road Vehicles Act, in which, you know, the first part's going to be some definitions, so that's easiest for me, I guess, just to go through some definitions. Uh, so in this, the code means the Michigan Vehicle Code, which is a different code. County road means county, primary, or county, local road, described in some sections. And as it turns out, you can drive off-road vehicles on <laughs> county roads. Uh, the dealer means a dealer, designated uh, farm vehicle means an implement of husbandry and a vehicle used in connection with farm operations. If you call it a farm vehicle, it is. Forest road means a hard surface road, gravel, dirt, or other road capable of travel by two-wheeled vehicle. Okay, and now what did we read earlier now? Because I, I, I need to go back and look at that. What was that I just read? This here. Is that one still open? No. Uh, and eligible national forest roads as well as frozen lakes. State forest roads, right? So it's required on county roads, state roads, national forest roads. You've got to have an ORV license. And close it down. I got too many things I'm trying to keep track of. I can't do it. I lost my shelf. Here we go. Um, now this is interesting. Highway means state trunk line highway or segment of 
state trunk line highway, so they don't call that a road. So you're off-road if you're on the highway. Highly restricted personal information, uh, late model ORV means ORV, manufactured current model year, okay. Local unit of government means a county, township, or municipality. That would make sense. Municipality means a city or a village. ORV, or unless the context implies a different meaning, vehicle means a motor-driven off-road recreation vehicle. Right now, what would make it recreation? Well, I'm not. It's not for hire. Right. It's not for hire. It's not a commercial vehicle. It must be for recreation. Capable of cross-country travel without the benefit of a road or trail. On or immediately over land, snow, ice, marsh, swampland, or other natural terrain. A multi-track, multi-wheel di drive vehicle. A motorcycle or a two-wheel vehicle. A vehicle with two or more, or, excuse me, three or more wheels. An amphibious machine, uh, yada, yada, yada. What it is it not? It is not include a registered snowmobile, a farm vehicle, a vehicle used for military, fire, emergency, law enforcement purposes. Those would be government vehicles. A vehicle owned and operated by a utility company or an oil and gas company, right? Those would be the utilities while performing maintenance. Construction or logging vehicle used in performance of common function. Or registered aircraft. So basically, if you register it as a motor vehicle for, you know, then it is a motor vehicle. But is it a passenger vehicle? Is it an off-road vehicle? Well, that depends on which of these laws that you follow when you register it, I guess. ORV safety certificate means uh, a safety certificate under whatever. So you could have you could have an ORV safety certificate issued to you and say that's your license. And who the owner is, and, 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 uh, roadway means the portion of a street, county road, or highway improved, designed, or ordinarily used for travel by vehicles registered under the code. Roadway does not include the shoulder. The shoulder isn't considered part of a road. So since it's not considered part of the road, it would just be considered over land, and you're car can drive down that without any problem so you have an off-road vehicle when you are on the shoulder you're off the road and so if they pull you over off the road and you don't have an off-road vehicle sticker on your car they can say hey you violated the off-road vehicle laws shoulder means that portion of a street county road or highway contiguous to the roadway and generally excluding the contour of the roadway, or extending the contour of the roadway, not designed for vehicle travel, but maintained for the temporary accommodation of disabled or stopped motor vehicles unless permitted, otherwise permitted on the roadway. All right, so it's not the roadway. It's not designed for vehicle travel. Yet my two-wheel vehicle will drive down just fine if I want to, so I must have an off-road vehicle. Well, there were a few other ones. I don't know if I marked them well enough. Uh, certificate of title. This is the way you want to do it. ORVs are exempt. An ORV is exempt from a Motor Vehicle Accident Claims Act. It takes you out of the idea of you having a motor vehicle under the Accident Claims Act. I'm not saying you don't have to have insurance necessarily, but it takes you out of this predicament here. And, you know, they have us doing insurance wrong, too, um, because we're registering our car wrong, and, and they won't. If you go to the Department of Motor Vehicles or to the Secretary of State, whatever it's called, they don't want you to do this stuff the right way, so they're trying to force you to do it a particular manner, and we need to say, hey, I'm not doing that. So I'm going to get my answers from the Department of resources because they're the ones that have jurisdiction over the <laughs> off-road vehicle. But this is what it says, right? Here's an application for ORV certificate of title. An application for a certificate of title shall be a form prescribed by the Department of State. Application shall include 
a certification. The owner or purchaser shall sign the application and the uh, application is filed electronically, provide information requested by the Department of State to verify the owner's identity. The application shall contain, in addition to such other information required by the Department of State, the following information. The applicant's name and address. A statement of any security or other liens on the ORV. The lien is not outstanding, a statement of the fact. There is no lien outstanding. A description of the ORV, including the year, make, model, series, vehicle identification number. Well, if you look at a Michigan vehicle, in fact, I got one here somewhere, certificate of title, nowhere on here does it specify what type of vehicle it is. It's just a, it gives a vehicle identification number, the year, the make, the model, the body style, title number, issue date, weight, owner's name, and then places to do the transfer if you're going to sign by a seller. But at the bottom of this thing, it says the state of Michigan. Michigan Department of State certifies. So the state of Michigan, comma, the state of Michigan, all proper case. Michigan Department of State certifies that this certificate of title is issued in compliance with the laws of Michigan and constitutes prima facie proof of ownership. Further, on the date of title insurance issuance, the described vehicle was subject to the security interest, interest listed above, and then if it had any, it would be listed. This is your registration. This certificate of title is your registration. This certifies that you're the owner. This is prima facie evidence of ownership. All right, so you keep this in your car and you give it to them. That's what I think we do with it. And so, and so because this piece of paper doesn't say anywhere that it is not an, an off-road vehicle, I'm going to say that the vehicle I have now, or could have, or should have, or whatever, is an off-road vehicle, and it's already titled. I have the title. What I don't have is the license. And if I got the license from the Department of uh, natural resources instead of the, the Secretary of State's office, well the license is cheaper and I don't have to have the insurance. Hey, that changes everything. All right, they don't make you get insurance on your brand new um, ATV. At least I don't believe it. Do I never had one? Do they? Do you, do, when you go and get one, do you, do you need to get insurance on it? Like you need to get insurance on a brand new car. If no, well then register it as an off-road vehicle. And make them prove that it isn't. Because, you know, I'm not quite ready to do this yet, but I'm really, really sure that that's what this is telling us to do is we're registering our vehicles wrong. Uh, fees for processing application for ORV certificate of title. The Department of State shall charge a fee of $11 for processing application for an ORV certificate of title or a duplicate certificate of title. The Department of State shall charge an additional fee of $5 for processing the application on an expedited basis. So that would make it $16. So what does it cost for a certificate of title? Can anybody tell me in Michigan? I don't really know. Refusal to issue an ORV certificate of title, right? So they could do it, and that would be, um, well, you didn't pay the fees. The applicant is not entitled to an ORV certificate of title under this part. The ORV is titled under the code, and they, by that they mean the motor vehicle code, which just means, well, it's already titled. And... Um, so if we look at some more of these thing so that would be like my truck has a street license plate so it would have been titled under the motor vehicle code do I need an off-road vehicle license and trail permit to ride on a designated ORV route no neither an ORV license nor a trail permit is required to drive a street license truck on a designated ORV route if, however, the route is not passable by conventional two-wheel drive passenger automobile designated for highway use, then the vehicle 
is being used as an ORV and requires both an ORV license and permit. And so what that's saying to me is if you pull over on the side of the road, highway, you're on that part of the road where it's no longer considered the highway, so you're not on highway use. This is off-road use, and you would have to have the ORV license and trail permit, even though you have the street license plate. I'm not saying you need to get a street license plate, but, you know, I'm just saying if it's already on there, it doesn't mean you can't go and get these other decals, basically, to put on your car and see if it changes the status of your vehicle as far as uh, being pulled over. Well, I'm not going to go and get this other one. I'm just going to go do the ORV and, on a car and drive it around and see if I get stopped. If they do, say, well, hey, it's an off-road vehicle. I'm using it on a county road the way it says I can. It meets the criteria of an off-road vehicle and um, they haven't defined what um, a, the route is not passable by a conventional two-wheel drive passenger automobile designated for highway use. Well, I'm not going to say it's a passenger automobile designated for highway use. I would do that if I was to have it uh, um, registered under the Motor Vehicle Code instead of under this off-road vehicle route. That's what I think. It's going to be interesting to find out. I, you know, I don't know if this is going to work, but what do I care? I'll just try it. Um, but all this, again, all these things I'm pointing out is the fact that, hey, there's a thing called the Department of Natural Resources, which has law enforcement as part of its doings. It's broken the state up into districts, and when you read about district courts and so forth, they, this could be a district just as easy as the thing they're calling a district that they drag you into now, because I know that's not the court, because the person sitting up there doesn't have a certificate of appointment or a certificate of election. And so I'm going to point it out as a crime. And I would think, well, you know, I should be able to take it to the people that wrote the ticket. But I should be able to take it to the any law enforcement officer. Because that's one of the things it says. If it's been done wrong, you should give it to a law enforcement officer to have him to see if it can be corrected. I'm not going to question it. I'm just going to give it to one. It's, you know, this happened in 2011. It's all, it's long done, so I don't really care, other than to have him agree with me, and then I have other things I want him to take care of. Because he can enforce all the criminal laws, which is the penal code. Right? Which is the penal code. Which is this wonderful... Uh, right here. The Act to revise, consolidate, and codify and add statutes relating to crimes to define, describe penalties and remedies to provide for restitution under certain circumstances. Now another thing, because they're peace officers, it says in the election code that if it's brought to a peace officer's attention that there's been election fraud, then he's supposed to immediately do something about it. And that's what I'll get him with next, because none of these people... You know, they don't have a proper oath. They don't have a proper bond. How many of you have gone look for somebody's oath or bond and not found what you were looking for? It's because they don't have them. Well, then they're not who they say they are. I don't want to argue about it. I want to go point the crime out. It's a crime. They're impersonating an officer. Quit arguing with them and, and trying to get them to agree with you and go point out the crime to somebody who has more power than they do. Because they actually, you know, because the other person, the one that we're going to go to, is actually representing the state. The state of Michigan. That's what I believe. We'll find out. I'll leave it at that, and uh, we'll just see what happens next. More coming soon. Thanks. See ya.